So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through some basic protocols associated with some rotator cuff and impingement uh, soft tissue treatments, uh, a few exercises to help stabilize and remodel these tissues, and then we're going to apply uh, some kinesiology tape to assist and support that shoulder through movement to help assist in those tissues actually remain in, in a healing state and to prevent repetitive strain on them as they go through their motion patterns. So Bob's going to be our lovely model for this today, and we're going to look at our first aspect of this is going to be associated with our soft tissue treatments. Our soft tissue treatments are going to be focusing on a couple of major things. The first one is going to be if there's actual tendinopathy. So if we did a manual muscle test on our patient, for whether it be supraspinatus and they're going ouch, 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 we'll keep that thumb up because we don't want to create impingement just yet, and that's painful, or we test posterior cuff down here, and that's painful on testing, we know that there's definitely some tendinopathy associated with it. Now from that perspective, we know that we need to do a pro-inflammatory style of a treatment on the tendons because we have to remember these tendinitis that everybody loves to call them are really tendinopathies, tendinosis. They're ropes that are fraying from the inside out. So what we need to do is create a very focal inflammation at that tendon to reinstitute the healing cascade, create collagen remodeling, and actually bring more fibroblasts to the area to lay down even more collagen. Now, in association with that, we're going to be using some exercises at the same time because what we do know from the literature is that if we apply eccentric loading associated with tendinopathy treatment, a pro-inflammatory application, we'll get a greater collagen production and the fibroblasts that we're bringing to the area because we're going to be using our instruments to create that pro-inflammatory response, that's going to bring in all those extra fibroblasts, activate the ones that are focal in the area, and then the eccentric loading is going to increase that collagen production. So we're going to start right from there. If I can have you actually take your shirt off. So if we're going to do some of that eccentric loading, we can use the CLX that we have right over here. And we're going to double this up, even though this is, this is a little bit heavier resistance. But all I want you to do is we're going to come out right into that concentric load. And then I want you to just slowly bring the arm back down. And then when we do the eccentric for the posterior cuff, we're going to be here. And we're going to slowly come back, OK? So the first thing we'll do is apply a little emollient right to those tendon areas. Understanding the two major regions that we have for tendinopathy are going to be either the myotendinous junction or an insertion point in the front of the shoulder. When we're talking about the supraspinatus, however, remember it's just not a single tendon that comes and attaches to the greater tuberosity. This tendon actually fans out along the front of the shoulder, so we have to be a little bit more broad, not just focal on that tendon. So we're going to start him doing his eccentric loads, thumb out. And we'll get right up onto that tendon region. We're going to be a little bit more aggressive with our instrument. We can follow it right around to the entire front of the shoulder. And if we're going into that myotendon junction, we'll find the depth of penetration with a finger. And then we'll take our instrument and come right along there. Now the important thing to understand when you're doing pro-inflammatory treatments is you're talking about 10 or 15 second bursts. We're not going to be doing this for three or four minutes. That, that actually is going to create too much of an inflammation. And from that perspective, all we're doing is creating more soreness. Uh, these are things that I've actually tested out over myself after 18 years of instrument-assisted teaching. Is The simple reality is I've done it on my own patellar tendon tear. And I tried five minutes, I tried 20 minutes, and the only thing 20 minutes actually does is just make your knee very, very sore for a couple of weeks. So what we've noticed is doing about 10 or 15 second bursts is what really gives you the optimal recovery in those tendons. Uh, part of it is a contact anesthesia that happens. It actually numbs the area. And then the second aspect is that pro-inflammatory response of starting the healing cascade all over again. If we're switching to the posterior cuff, we're just going to concentrically load out there. We're going to work into this area. And once again, finding those tendons, being pro-inflammatory right over them. I always use my finger to find that depth of penetration first. Then the instrument comes along so that you're not pushing in heavy with stainless steel. You're actually pushing in more with your finger. And then we'll follow that tendon all the way out along the front until we hit that greater tuberosity.
Now that's the first part of what we can do associated with our pro-inflammatory treatment associated with the tendon injuries. However, when you're talking about impingement, impingement really is much more of a global problem. The muscles that are associated with controlling the shoulder are all out of balance, and that's just looking locally. There could be kinetic chain issues going around, like a bad, uh, since we're working on his left shoulder, it could be a bad right hip. There could be something going around, wrong with that uh, kinetic chain on the right-hand side, especially if it's a plant leg and a thrower, uh, or a volleyball player, or something along those lines. So we're going to look at this just focally right now. In that aspect, however, we're going to treat this entire upper quadrant in a little bit more of what we call a neurosensory manner. In other words, it's just basically the weight of the instrument. But what we're going to do is normalize the tone of all this tissue. A lot of the time when people talk about soft tissue treatments, they like to say, we're facilitating something or we're inhibiting something. That's actually not the way it really works. What we're doing is we're stimulating the receptors in the skin. These receptors are A-beta fibers, and because of that, they get really reflexively loop back within the central nervous system, and they control the spindle. So in other words, if the spindle is overactive, it helps calm it down. If it's underactive, it helps wake it up. So it helps control the firing pattern as well as the length tension of that tissue. So we're going to normalize all of those tones. And it's just to understand that you actually create a neurosensory um, stimulus, all you got to look for is a hyperemia on the skin. Once we get that reddening on the skin, you know that you stimulated the neuroreceptors because you created a vasodilation. And again, we'll work through that whole quadrant, deltoid, pec, upper trap levator region, medial scapular stabilizers, lower scapular stabilizers, over the posterior cuff. And again, once we got a little bit of that hyperemia, we can pretty much say, all right, we've normalized those tones, which only takes, again, seconds to a few minutes because you're not trying to create this massive response. It's just a hyperemia. Very, very light pressure, barely the weight of the instruments. The next critical aspect in normalizing tissue actually happens within the axillary region. These are critical areas for us to be able to work on in order to improve scapular dyskinesia, one of the primary reasons we get a shoulder impingement. And there's a few areas in particular that I like to work with. Obviously, we can neurosensory through the entire lat. But the tendinous area uh, at the inferior glenoid, this is a major area of, of treatment that we want to look at. The axillary fascia, a lot of people like to say subscapularis, but the reality is the subscapularis is so deep, we're probably not necessarily touching it. But what we are touching is the axillary fascia as it folds into that area, as well as the pec fascia. So we're going to do three separate movement patterns for this. We're going to stay right here, and we're going to just cl uh, clip right onto that tendon. And our patient is then just going to slowly raise that arm up. And we're going to just pin and stretch right through that. Two more times. And last one. And then the next area we'll work on is going to be that axillary fascia. The important thing here is not to actually overpress into the tissue. What we want to do is just find where the depth of penetration is. Where is the block? We don't have to exceed where that block is. Come in, grab it. Now, what I do, and I don't have the largest hands in the world, but I love grabbing that inferior angle of the scapula to assist in rotation. So as he starts coming up again, I'll push on that medial border of the scapula, pulling into lateral rotation, which is what's going to happen as we go through abduction, assist the movement pattern while blocking and pin and stretching through that other tissue. So we'll just demonstrate that one more time. So we're going to pin through there. And then our last one is going to be associated more with our pec fascia. Now with the pec fascia, once again, you're only going in as far as the, the uh, tissue will allow you to go. You don't have to exceed that. And what we'll have the patient do is almost like a PNF pattern. We'll grab right into that tissue, and he's just going to open up into a PNF pattern. And we can strip through that fascia anteriorly in the pec. One more time. And for me, those three areas actually tend to be the biggest bang for the buck associated with shoulder impingement because most of that problem tends to come from this area and scapular dyskinesia. There are other reasons that we can look at, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we do our lectures this weekend. Um, once we've actually done that neural resetting of those tissues, we've done the tendinopathy treatments with a pro-inflammatory application, the next thing that we're going to look at is actually how do we help stabilize this when they leave our office. And one of the best ways I've found to do it, especially for shoulder impingement, is uh, an anterior superior translation taping. This is one of the ones that 
I've kind of taken through a couple of different sources and actually just merged them together. However, I came up with a test, which is basically a mulligan mobilization, to determine whether or not this is going to be an effective tape job. One of the problems that I always have when, with, with taping is that people always say, oh, that tape didn't work for me. Well, that's because they probably didn't evaluate you to know that the tape job will be effective. My big uh, thing when I teach taping is that every tape job has a pre and a post. In other words, there's always going to be something on an evaluation that's going to show you your tape job is going to be effective. It's not a guess. You know it before it even goes on the body. So the mulligan mobilization that we do with this is I'm just going to gently, and I mean it's basically just the pressure of your hand, no pushing, right on the front of his shoulder. Let's just turn you around for a second. Back of my hand helps in that scapular motion. And we're going to just have him abduct. So he's just going to bring that arm up into abduction. All the way up, thumb up. And what we're looking for is with an impingement, our patients are usually going to say there's a painful arc or pain somewhere around uh, shoulder level all the way up to the top. That just tells you a little bit more of where the tendon injuries may be as well as where the impingement is. And we're looking for him to either have an easier time moving the arm, decrease pain, or greater range of motion, but any functional change that's going to show us that this is effective. So once again, we're going to just block here, and he's going to come right up into abduction. Now, the first couple of times you do this, you may just need to feel out the body's motion. And then once you figure it out, it's a lot easier to just move with them and help correct it. And if the patient's going, oh, yeah, that feels a lot better as you're stabilizing it, we're going to go right through this tape job now. Now, since we just used emollient on a patient, I don't necessarily have some rubbing alcohol here right now to clean them off, although we can use Biofreeze for that. We would obviously clean off the, the tissue that we just worked on with our soft tissue. Once we know it's dry, we're going to start measuring out our tape job. For the purpose of this demonstration, we're just going to do it on the other shoulder because there's no emollient on it. Now, the first tape job we do is a superior translation one. And we're going to measure from top of the shoulder. We're going to measure down to just past the inferior angle of the scapula. And that's going to be our first strip. And the second strip we're going to do is measuring from the front of the shoulder to the medial board of the scapula. And that's going to be our second cut. Now, our first cut is what I like to call the lowercase y. We're going to round these edges just to make sure it doesn't catch clothing. For this tape job, we're going to break the tails and then create a two-inch base. We'll take off the backing. The first thing that we do is patient position. We want to get him into his good anatomical position, which helps put the head of the humerus back into the glenoid. We're going to apply that taping right to the back of the posterior cuff. Now with about a 50% stretch. Now the great thing is with uh, exact stretch tape from TheraBand, um, what we have here is our exact stretch indicators. So I want to make sure that I'm getting a pretty decent stretch on this. So the big hexagons in this area, once I have them to an equidistant sides, I know I'm at a 50% stretch. And you can actually see this on that half one right here. That's non-equidistant. I hit it right there. So now I can just lay the, the tape down. I know exactly that I've gotten to 50% stretch. Depending on how severe the translation issues are, you may actually increase that stretch past 50%. An important thing is never have stretch at the end of the tape. Otherwise, that creates irritation and blisters. On the back end, all we're going to do is paper off tension all the way down. OK? Our second strip of tape, this is for anterior translation. The anterior translation tape job, we're going to place that right over those two tails, making sure that we have part of the tape on the skin. Tape doesn't like to stick to itself. And now, depending on the size of your shoulder is how much you're really going to stretch this. Again, how much translation in the shoulder will also influence it. But when I have a guy who's got a big muscular shoulder, let's just say like somebody like a linebacker or maybe a defensive lineman or offensive lineman, somebody with a really huge shoulder, you're going to put almost no stretch on the tape. Because the problem is, is as they bring the arm up into abduction, a large shoulder with a lot of stretch, the tape will actually roll up. Now, he's got a pretty muscular shoulder, but nothing that I have to worry about that it's going to roll up that easy. So I can go anywhere between 25 and 50% stretch here. We can see we've exceeded 25% now with the small exact stretch indicator. And now I'm just going to lay down the tape the rest of the way. We got to, we've got to make sure that we rub this tape. It's heat activated. And especially when tape's over tape, you really want to give it an extra rub. 
to make sure that it sticks. And now when he goes through his abduction movement pattern, he'll probably notice it's a little bit easier to go through movement. Go ahead and just give that abduction again. And it also takes a lot of pressure off your impingement. But the important thing is we had a test beforehand that told us it would be a proper tape job, not going, oh, this is what I do for shoulder impingement and guessing it will work. When I teach taping classes, my first algorithm for taping is don't tape. If you don't have something that shows up positive that tells you the tape job is going to be effective, why are you wasting your time, your money, or your patient's money? It doesn't make any sense. Tape is a massive effective tool when it's used properly. So I thank my uh, lovely model here for going through our soft tissue treatment uh, as well as our taping procedures. What we would always finish off with with our taping, especially for somebody sore, we can take our biofreeze and literally spray right over the tape and we can rub that in. Well, thanks for spending some time with us and watching our shoulder impingement. <laughs>